All right, hello everybody, women and men, everybody, um, wherever you are coming in, turning into, tuning into this. I am gonna start the book um, on mysticism by Evelyn Underhill. But before I start it, I'm gonna run over to the beach because I would love to read it there. I usually read in really cool places just cause I'm drawn to them myself. But it was a very cloudy day and so the sun was never out. I just finished um, skating on the boardwalk <laughs> and, uh, and doing my workout and stuff. But I'll show you the ocean first. So you see that it was here. Maybe if my windows are down, we'll hear it. If I had a flashlight, I could um, read at the same time. But I still haven't got one for my car. But I brought the book. So bear with me for a second. It's an amazing book. I started reading it myself. My name is Dr. Cheryl Meyer. I'm a psychologist in my day job and I have a YouTube channel and I wrote a tweet the other day that I was like, I'm quoting Elliot Smith and Bob Marley. Elliot Smith was one of my friends. He was a musician, right? And I'm quoting Jesus because he knew stuff. But anyway, but I welcome all religions. Uh, Evelyn Underhill is just amazing. She explains the science of mysticism, of if you want to call it a science, the art. All right, you got to see this. Hopefully, you can see something. It's so great. Oh, there's someone up on the lifeguard stand. I wish I could just bring my flashlight up there. I probably have one in my car. I have emergency stuff. But I'm not going to look for it tonight. I'll have to come here another day. It's a very long book. Can't see the waves. I'll get close. Might as well. If you want just the book, then just fast forward this part. It's a long book and it's amazing. And so let's just have a slow start. I say I help people navigate through their spiritual awakening and all of life is a spiritual awakening. But, you know, I'm a multifaceted person and we're souls in a human body, so I just represent, I represent consciousness, soul consciousness, divine consciousness, divine love. As much as I can, I try to get out of the way and just let that have its way. Speak with me. Some of you I know don't live by the ocean. I did it growing up, so. Look, that is a giant wave, whoa. Oh. My, I don't know if my case is getting in the way, no? It's pretty muggy out here, but it feels so good at the same time. Like, there's the palm trees. Yeah. All right, let's go back to the car and start the book. Oh, I don't even know if I locked my car. Shoot. Because that was just... Anyway, um, let me think what else. Okay, so Evelyn Underhill, uh, Died in 1947, I think. And so if it's 75 years after the death of the author, I heard that it's free copyright. I looked this up too. Her book was written in 1910, this book that I'm gonna read. And I'm, I ordered a 1910 edition, so that's on its way. Because I'm all legitimate. I don't wanna take anybody's stuff, you know, that's not free domain. But I read that if, hold on, if, um. If um, you have, let's see, if it's over a hundred years since the book was written, then you can use it. So, sorry, I'm multitasking. All right. I'm in Southern California right now. That's usually all I'll say because I keep my location just not, not known. Um, let me think. So Evelyn Underhill, right? She wrote C.S. Lewis one time. And uh, I don't know, one time, more than that. They, the Charles Williams loved her and Charles Williams was part of the Inglings, which was a part of a group with Tolkien and C.S. Lewis. And um, I can't remember if Dorothy Sayers was ever part of that. 
I have a feeling she was. I took this class on C.S. Lewis five years, five different times in my college. All right. Um, um, but she wrote C.S. Lewis, and she said um, that his idea of God was too tame. Here, let me... Oh, you'll see me in the car. I was like, you can see me for a second. Um, and so I think he came up with Aslan after that, right? He wrote the Narnia books, and I got to go to the pub. It's called the Eagle and Child in Oxford, where they would meet. But Evelyn Underhill was just... She's just so profound and intelligent and like just such an inspiration for us as women and as people, as, as people wanting to understand spiritual, the spiritual path, right? I think I was, I was just going to read this for myself, but, um, I'm all sweaty from everything. Um, but I just felt like this is just way too important for me to just read for myself. So I wanted to read it for you guys as well, for whoever comes around here and finds it, right? And um, please like, share, comment, whatever you want. Comment, just say random stuff, it doesn't matter. Say what your favorite part of the book was. Um, just start quoting Shakespeare. It doesn't matter, like, it does matter. I think that the more you engage, the more, um, you're gonna get this in you. You're gonna get this book in you. I was. I took a class this morning and um, Latoya was saying, you know, that the divine God, lo God divine love, um, had her start telling people comment in the comments and say these things and these things and these things because repetition is the mother of skill. When you repeat these things, you, um, and you write them, when you write them in your own journal or write them down, then, you start learning them on a deeper level. You start, um, they seep in, our subconscious is wired from our childhood. You know, like I said, I'm a psychologist in my day job. So I understand more and more how this stuff works. All right, I'll remember maybe seven minutes in is when we start the book. All right, I'm gonna start from the very, very beginning. I usually skip the preface, you know, um, but since I read it, the, I just started the preface in the first chapter. I was like, wait, I got to start over and read this for people. It's so good. Um, all right. Maybe you can hear the ocean. Okay. I won't show the cover of this one because it's, it's probably a newer edition. This is a preface to the 12th edition that was written by Evelyn Underhill before she died, right? Since this book first appeared 19 years ago, so 19 years after 1910, something like that, the study of mysticism, not only in England, oh, she's British, but also in France, Germany, and Italy has been almost completely transformed from being regarded, whether critically or favorably, as a byway of religion, it is now more and more even generally accepted by theologians, philosophers, and psychologists as representing, in its intensive form, the essential religious experience of man. Mysticism, she's saying, forms the essential religious experience of man. All right, the labors of a generation of religious psychologists that's me <sighs> this is so awesome like the, this is such a profound book if you can listen to any part of this and just let it go on in the background or listen intently you're gonna your your life is gonna be so transformed from that I can just I have a knowing you know it's a mystical thing it's a mystic it's your intuition your inner knowing gives you knowing your soul's knowing it's like a well, anyway, I'll let her describe all of it. I'm really excited. Anyway. <sighs> the labors of a generation of religious psychologists. Okay, so, uh, yeah. The labors of a generation of religious psychologists following, and to some extent superseding the pioneer work of William James, have already done much to disentangle its substance from the psycho physical accidents which often accompany mystical apprehension whilst oops i hit the charger pulled it down hold on
Whilst we are less eager than our predecessor, predecessors to dismiss all accounts of abnormal experiences as the fruit of superstition or disease, no responsible student now identifies the mystic and the ecstatic or looks upon visionary and other extraordinary phenomenon as either guaranteeing or discrediting the, the witness of the mystical saints. So when we hear about people having mystical, mystic exper mystical experiences, I've had a lot of them, um, just because they've had a wild one doesn't mean that it is a true mystic experience, you know, or, and it doesn't, we don't discredit that either. It's just, um, She'll explain it a lot more. <laughs> I already know because I read just part of the first chapter. So, um, so if they have extraordinary phenomena, it doesn't either guarantee or discredit the witness of the mystical saints. Even though remorseless explorations and destructive criticisms of the psychoanalytic school are now seen to have affected a useful work, throwing into relief the genuine spiritual activities of the psyche, while explaining in a naturalistic sense some of their less fortunate psycho, psychophysical ac accompaniments, you know, when you have physical and psychological accompaniments. The philosophic and theological landscape also, with its increased emphasis on transcendence, its new friendliness to the concept of the supernatural is becoming ever more favorable to the mystical claims of the mystics. On the one hand, the prompt welcome given to the work of Rudolf Otto, amazing work, um, and Karl Barth, and on the other, the renewed interest in Thomas philosophy seems to indicate a growing recognition of the distinctness and independence of the spiritual order. And a revival of... the creaturely sense, strongly contrasting with the temper of the late 19th century thought. Were I then now planning this book for the first time, its arguments would be differently stated. More emphasis would be given to the concrete, richly living, yet unchanging character of the reality, with a capital R, over against the mystic, as the first term, cause and incentive of his experience. To that paradox of utter contrast Okay, wait. Okay, so she says, Were I then, now planning this book for the first time, its arguments would be differently stated. More emphasis would be given, A, to the concrete, richly living, yet unchanging character of the reality over and against the mystic, as the first term, cause, and incentive of his experience. B, to that paradox of utter contrast, yet profound relation between the creator and the creature, God and the soul, which makes possible his development, and see to the predominant part played in that development by the free and prevenient action of the supernatural, in theological language by grace, that's grace, as against all merely evolutionary or emergent theories of spiritual transcendence. I feel more and more that no psychological or evolutionary treatment of man's spiritual history can be adequate, which ignores the element of givenness in all genuine mystical knowledge. Though the mystic life means organic growth, its first term must be sought on, in, uh, sought in ontology, which I think ontology is how we know, the study of how we know ontology. Ology means the study of aunt, I don't remember, but, you know, theology means the study of theos, God, the Greek word for God. Ontology, I think the study of knowing. Um, psychology is the study of the psyche, ology, psyche, your soul. That's what I always, when I went to graduate school and got my doctorate in psychology, I always looked at it because I took Greek college before that as the study of the soul. I didn't know what other people were there for, but I was there to study the soul. And so that's why I think you know, I've always integrated it with, with, with spirituality and a spiritual path and wanting to understand that on a very deep level. Just wanted to say a prayer and, and give this over.
you know, to divine, to, um, you know, to speak in, in whatever way sees fit. Mostly I'm going to be doing reading, but um, because I am a psychologist, sometimes I'll, you know, I've been a psychologist for the last 22 plus years, and I got my doctorate for nine years before that, undergrad and grad school. So I just um, will sometimes bring it in, but I really love what she's doing here. So welcome, welcome. Um, subscribe to my channel. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you're watching it on somewhere else, you're probably not because it just went over 15 minutes. So it cuts off after 15 right now on those. But um, put on the notifications and all that so that you can know when I upload new videos and um, we can grow my channel so that other people have access to this and know about it. All right. I feel more and more that no psychological or evolutionary treatment of man's spiritual history can be adequate, which ignores the element of givenness in all genuine mystical knowledge. Though the mystic life means organic growth, its first term must be sought in ontology, in the vision of the principle, as St. Gregory the Great, he's so amazing, he's in the book The Philokalia, um, taught long ago. For the real sanction of that life does not adhere in the fugitive experiences or even the transformed personality of the subject, but in the medical, metaphysical object, with a capital O, which that subject apprehends. It'll make a lot more sense, more. Some of this, she gets a little technical. Anyway, again, it now seems to me that a critical realism, which found room for the duality of our full human experience, the eternal and the successive supernatural and natural reality would provide a better philosophic background to the experience of the mystics than the vitalism which appeared 20 years ago to offer so promising a way of escape from scientific determinism. Determinism more and more abandoned by its old friends, the physicists, is no longer the chief enemy to such a spiritual interpretation of life as is required by the experience of the mystics. It's rather a naturalistic monism, a shallow doctrine of eminence unbalanced by any adequate sense of transcendence, which now threatens to remodel theology in a sense which leaves no room for the noblest and purest reaches of the spiritual life. Yet in spite of the adjustments required by such a shifting of the philosophic outlook and by nearly 20 years of further study and meditation, I love that part. She's saying by nearly 20 years more of further study and meditation, here she is writing this preface, like, and she edited some of the book here. Amazing, amazing. You have no idea, like, what 20 years of meditation is. I was doing a video the other day, a teaching video, and it came to my intuition, my knowing, uh, to say it's like taking beautiful marbles. What if you took one every time you did a meditation and you put it in a jar and how big that would get? And I was like looking online and, and I even asked this woman in Germany, can I use your picture of um, these marbles in a jar? She had these antique, she's called them German marbles. Um, and I never heard back from her. But the next day I went to a pizza place with my kid and there was this giant gumball machine like like as big as my car as as big as my car as long as my car and um and so I took a picture in front of it because it was exactly what I was talking about is like as you keep meditating you learn how to get deeper into silence and you grow more and more accustomed to it and more and more like you're just ready you prepare the ground it's like Jesus was talking about putting the seed on good soil so that it could grow up into good so that the cares of this world don't choke it out. You, um, when you choose to be present and meditate, you keep preparing that good ground and you're not chasing after consolation, but you're letting the Holy Spirit or however you understand it, the divine love work in you. And um, you're surrendering more and more like, uh, Mary, when she says, be it unto me according to thy will. 
just gonna lock my door on. <laughs> All right, turn on the air a little bit. Whoa, whoa. All right. So my lights get some battery. Anyway, or whatever it's called. So she said, after 20 years further of study and meditation, the final positions which seem to me to be required by the existence of, of mysticism remain substantially unchanged. 20 years ago, I was already convinced that the facts of man's spiritual experience pointed to a limited dualism, a diagram which found place for his contrasting apprehension of absolute and contingent, being and becoming, simultaneous and successive. If you think of Einstein said, there's no such thing as a linear, linear timeline, as linear time. Um, because if you think of the divine above, the divine sees all of it. And, um, you know, I won't say more about that, but she's talking about um, a diagram which found its place for his contrasting apprehension of absolute and contingent. The absolute and that's what's contingent to that being and becoming simultaneous and successive further that these facts involved the existence of him to a certain doubleness a higher and lower natural and transcendent transcendental self something equivalent to that funklian spark and i, I don't know who funklian it's capital f a spark or apex of the soul on which the mystics have always insisted as the instrument of their special experience. Both these opinions were then unpopular. The second in particular has been severely criticized by Professor Pratt and other authorities on the psycholog psychology of religion. Yet the constructive work which has since been done on the metaphysical implications of mystical experience has tended more and more to establish their necessity, at least as a basis of analysis. And they can now claim the most distinguished support. The recovery of the concepts of the supernatural, a word which no respectable theologian of the last generation cared to use, is closely linked with the great name of Friedrich von Hugel. His persistent opposition to all merely monastic, pantheist, and eminent, eminental philosophies of religion, and his insistence on the need of, two, of a two-step diagram of the reality, a reality accessible to man. The little heeded in his lifetime are now bearing fruit. This reinstatement of the transcend, transcendent, the holy other, the quote, holy other, as the religious fact is perhaps the most fundamental of the philosophic changes which have directly affected the study of mysticism. I just remembered C.S. Lewis, you know, the guy that wrote to the Narnia books and mere Christianity and the problem of pain and the abolition of man and all those books and was Tolkien is the one that brought C.S. Lewis to Christianity or, you know, um, back to it. If you, if you understand when he was 33, because he was an atheist. And Lewis explained to him, I mean, Tolkien, J.R. Tolkien explained to him that it was like myth become real. Christ entered into the myth, but you don't have to believe any of that stuff um, to be here. Like we're, we're studying mysticism. It's called the nature and development of spiritual consciousness, mysticism, right? But um, C.S. Lewis had a book, uh, I mean, had a list of the 10 most influential books in his life. And Rudolf Otto, Otto's book, I have it, I just can't remember what it's called, like the Numina. Someone can comment below. Um, Numina, it was about that, um, was on the list of the 10. And also the Consolation of Philosophy. Whoops, I, that was me honking. My, the book is so thick. <gasps> the Consolation of Philosophy was in that. Um, what is this? bookmark that I have. It's like a 3D rose. Uh, I got in a meditation, I got rose is rise, open your soul eyes. Rise up to your higher mind. 
All right. So, um, anyway, I just wanted to mention that Rudolph Otto book because I started reading that. It's a, uh, it goes really deep. Huh? Oh, the Constellation of Philosophy by Boethius was written in about 480 AD, 482 or something. Anyway, it's a really amazing book. I gave a copy to my friend Elliot Smith when he was alive. Um... It thus obtains a metaphysical background which harmonizes with its greatest declaration and supports its claims to empirical knowledge of the truth on which all religion rests. Closely connected with the transcendence of its object are the twin doctrines emphasized in all von, Hegel, von Hugel's work. First, that while mysticism is an essential element in a full human religion, it can never be the whole content of such religion. It requires to be embodied in some degree in history, dogma, and institutions if it is to reach the sense-conditioned human mind. That's important. She'll, she'll say more about that. Um, it's talking about if you want to understand this mystically from the scripture, if you want to understand it in the New Testament, how it was shown, Jesus sent Peter and John to go get the room, to go prepare the room for his communion and to prepare the upper room for the Last Supper. And Peter represents the physical church and John represents the mystic. And so Peter, it's like on this rock, this will stand like Christ is, let's say, the rock or Christ means the anointed one. But um, the the some people call this the Christ consciousness. I'm not saying it's the same exact thing, but it's like on this, when Christianity first came about, they called it the way and they followed the way. Um, and Augustine, St. Augustine, there's a quote from St. Augustine. You, you tell me what it means if you want. You know, I'm not arguing theology, but he said, that the thing we now call Christianity was here before it was called Christianity. We now call it Christianity. And so it's like, you know, the resurrection was necessary. I'm not saying it wasn't, but, um, and the Holy Spirit, you know, you get metanoia and you get theosis. Theosis is the transformation of the soul. Um, the Greek Orthodox say that God became man so that man could become God. It's called theosis. It's this transformation. Metanoia means to repent, but it's a metamorphosis of your noose. And so you become something else. It's like you are a seed that goes in the ground and must be born of the flesh and born of the spirit. Something has to be born of the spirit. And so Jesus talks about the dead. Leave the dead to bury their own dead. You come and follow me to this higher path. So there is a higher, a higher path. It goes really deep, but um, so, but there's something that's, it's not just people having mystical experiences. You can't just keep having mystical experiences. They have to be grounded in something like Jesus came in physical form. God in the Old Testament, in the, in the Torah gave the the covenant to a certain group of people and there was a remnant even when they were taken in babylon and they got out and they had the exodus you know exodus movement i can't sing the song because uh i don't want to use bob marley's song but um it's a great song um um anyway so um there's always been a line of physicality of being grounded in like even if you think of adam and eve adam the word adam means come out of the earth and eve came out of adam you know and like anyway um that's interesting because i just thought of moses that means one drawn out of the water so moses was drawn out of the water which is like flowing flowing truth jesus had the water and the blood come out of him Anyway, um, 
she'll talk more about it, I'm sure. So it requires to be embodied in some degree in history, dogma, and institutions. If it is to reach the sense conditioned human mind, right? Because our human mind is conditioned with the five senses, you know, and the sixth sense. But, um, you know, we're in this world of duality. We come from the oneness. We come, we're made in the image and likeness of the divine love, but we come into this duality, you know, where there's good, bad, up, down, and we come from the singularity, the oneness, the divine, absolute, infinite beingness. Um, I'm still here. If you're just listening to this, I just was being, being present. Always you can ground yourself in presence. Feel yourself in your body. And um, connect with your deeper essence of yourself. Not just your personality self and your name and your outer persona and your critical mind. You know, you can have that all you'd like. I... I you know, test whatever she says. I'm not saying take it all as truth. Take anything that I say, take it to, to the divine love and test it yourself because I don't always have everything right and neither does she. Um, but she's so studied and I just love her. And uh, it's such an honor and a privilege that this book came across my path and we get to be entering it. it we're just, it's such a gift. You have no idea. You have no idea like the gift that we have by um, her taking the time to read all these books and write this for us and me taking the time to, you know, not go out. This guy asked me out on a date tonight. <laughs> but um, I didn't give him my phone number yet. Anyway, um, so, but um, I'm just like, yeah, I'd rather start this book, you know? And not just that, but that I have a taste for this and a longing to equip people just like I am equipped because the divine love equips me and I feel it's such a blessing I always not to be not to have religious language I don't like doing that but I always want to give back to other people with the open hand with what's been given to me um, because it's just like it can make such a profound difference in your life it can help rewrite you know, you really, metanoia is like becoming the caterpillar into the butterfly. You become something completely different than you were, than the messages given to you in childhood, you know, that messed us up, you know, um, that just cut us off from, from divine love, which we came from, which we're all connected to. All right, I'm going to turn my car on a little bit again, so I don't run out of my, run my battery down. All right, so she said... It requires to be embodied in some degree in history, dogma, and institutions if it's to reach the sense-conditioned human mind. Secondly, that the antithesis between the religions of, quote, authority and of spirit, the, quote, church, and the, quote, mystic, is false. Each requires the other, the, quote, exclusive, quote, mystic, who condemns all outward forms and rejects the support of the religious complex is an abnormality. He inevitably tends towards pantheism and seldom exhibits in its richness the unitive life. You know, just go off on your own path. You're untethered by the successive apostleship, you know, where it's like Peter appointed someone, that Peter appointed someone else's bishop or John appointed someone else's bishop or I don't know, through Peter, and someone else and then all there's a successive they have all the way through all of the popes they can trace it back to um, Peter you know and I'm not saying all of them were um, really good but they um, I'm like so many of them were um, and there is still a successive line of the teaching getting passed through physical people who first had, were eyewitnesses of Christ and knew him anyway She's talking something about that, but the exclusive mystic who condemns all outward forms and rejects 
the support of the religious complex is an abnormality. He inevitably, he or she, she's talking about he or she, tends towards pantheism and seldom exhibits in its richness the unitive life. It is the inclusive mystic whose freedom and originality are fed but not hampered by the spiritual tradition within which he appears, who accepts the incarnational status of the human spirit and can find the inward in the outward as well as the inward in the inward, who shows us in their fullness and beauty the life-giving possibilities of the soul transfigured in God. Second in importance, among the changes, so she's saying, she's saying, I'm just going to translate that briefly. I'm not, I'm, I'm going to keep going back to her work. But when I was reading that the first time a few days ago, I don't remember how many days ago that was, I was in my intuitive mind and I was seeing how like if I go to a church that is mystic, a mystic church, that means they, they believe that they're entering into the divine realm when they do the, cer the ceremony of, of communion. They believe that the divine is actually changing the body and the blood into Christ or, or whatever. And you don't have to have the same faith. But when I go in there and they're connected, it's like I can hear the Holy Spirit will speak to me into my life because I cultivate this relationship with God in the quiet. So I have a personal relationship and then I will get things in my inner man, my inner woman, my inner, it's not a man or a woman, in my inner soul. And so the person can be speaking about one thing and I will keep hearing things in my spirit. And so the mystic experiences can happen through this physical thing where they're just going through these ordinary motions of entering into the supernatural. But, um, you know, anyway, so she said that in, it is the inclusive mystic whose freedom and originality are fed, but not hampered by the spiritual tradition, which it appears. And so when I go into the church, I, I had to find one that would, would appreciate me being a mystic. Um, and I'm saying this for all of us, you know, there is such a thing. There is such a thing. I, you know, our culture will say, Oh no, there's no such thing. I have to go to burning man and be on my own path. And, you know, just, uh, just listen to the Beatles on, you know, certain drugs or something, you know, it's like, no, you know, there are, there are, there are churches, there are like the Essene churches, perhaps, if they were Essene, I heard they were, but you don't have to agree with that. I'm not saying for sure that Mary was part of, you know, and John the Baptist was part of, and Jesus grew up in, in both. Like he was, he went to the temple, you know, but um, there are churches that are sincere and they welcome you having a true mystic experience and aren't afraid of that even if not everybody in that church understands that you feed them by you being authentic in your divine relationship with with divine love and they feed you in their groundedness you know so none of us make fun of the other person every there's uh different members of the body you know the fingers can't say the toes aren't important or the eyeballs can't say the nose not important all of this is important and it's part so we respect each other and it's important not to judge not to judge because you don't know where where the divine love is working in someone's life or um that's why I welcome all people here of all religions to just study mysticism so we can understand the science of it. Um, but I'm not going to like leave out things that I've experienced as a psychologist and as a practicing, let's say, mystic. Um, person who um, loves the holy teachings that Christ showed. But I also visited Rumi's grave. I love what Rumi was showing. And the Buddha was, you know, a, there's a quote that says, um, there's a, there's writing somewhere, I gotta find it. My brother was asking me where it was. I heard from another mystic. So I wanna look this up and verify it, that the Buddha 
which just means awakened, um, predicted when the Christ was going to come. He predicted, he told his disciples like, hey, the Christ is going to come and manifest here on earth in 600 years. You know, he said when he was going to come and what, this is how you tell the signs, you know? And so I'm not saying everything is the same, but I'm saying um, sh what she'll say is we all come from the divine and we're all looking for the divine. We're all looking to have a true connection with the divine and a true understanding of it. And so um, in the New Testament, I think it says, who are you to judge another man's servant? To his own master, he stands or falls. And I just wrote it down in my journal, in my journal or on my phone yesterday. I think it's in Psalm, or maybe it was this morning, Psalm 145. It says, it was just simple. It was like, and God loves all his creation, all creation. Ah, and Rumi, I wrote a Rumi quote today. I tweeted it. Um, he said, um, wherever you are and whatever you do, be in love. And I put it, uh, capital L, be in divine love. He said, go do something strange, build an ark. You know, Rumi says this, right? Rumi was a Sufi mystic poet. All right, so. Second in importance, oh wait, unit of life, okay. Second in importance among the changes which have come over the study of mysticism, I should reckon the work done during the last decade upon the psychology, oh wait, okay, wait, I'm gonna go back a little bit. Uh, within he appears who accepts the incarnate, okay. Yeah, incarnational status of the, okay. It is the inclusive mystic whose freedom and originality are fed but not hampered by the spiritual tradition within which he appears, who accepts the incarnation, incarnational status of the human spirit and can find, can quote, find the inward in the outward as well as the inward in the inward, who shows us in their fullness and beauty the life-giving possibilities of the soul transfigured in God. The life-giving possibilities of the soul transfigured in God. Second in importance among the changes which have come over the study of mysticism, I should reckon the work done during the last decade upon the psychology of prayer and contemplation. I cannot comment here upon the highly technical discussions between experts as to the place where the line is to be drawn between natural and supernatural, active and infused operations of the soul in communion with God, or the exact distinction between ordinary and extraordinary contemplation. But the fact that these discussions have taken place is itself significant and requires from religion, religious psychology the acknowledgement of a genuine twofoldness in human nature. The difference in kind between animus and the surface self, or animus, the surface self, a-N-I-M-U-S, remember? And anima, A-N-I-M-A, -A, the transcendental self, in touch with supernatural. Let me see if they need me to, oh no, okay. Sometimes people are parallel parking. I'll, I'd go up if they needed room, but I don't know what they're doing. The transcendental self, in touch with supernatural realities. Here the most important work has been done in France. Oh my gosh, like one of my favorite, favorite quotes is by this man. He's from, he's a Russian physicist, but he, he lived in France for a while and his name is Pavel Florensky. And he wrote about art, oh, it's so good, art, true art. Like all my videos have this quote infused in it. Um, is when you go up into the divine, you go into the divine realms and you're getting, um, you're seeing uh, like what Plato said, the original forms of things up there and then you're translating it into language here. Um, I'm just totally n not getting that quote, but anyway, I, I can't wait to hear what she says. And now my French is not so good. I lived in Montreal for one year, so just, I don't know if I'm going to spell this stuff or try to pronounce it, but you know, uh, if you want to write it out phonetically for other people, feel free in the comments. 
but it's eight o'clock. I didn't eat since 11.30, I think, or 12. Maybe I had a late lunch at 12. I'm getting hungry, but we're gonna go. I'm gonna make these like an hour. <laughs> but I'm just saying like, we're so lucky to have this. We're so lucky. Like whatever, I'm not saying any of that stuff to brag or anything like that. I'm saying whatever you set aside to follow spiritual disciplines for the love of other people, it's always worth it. It's like a thousand times worth it. I don't care if one person watches this video. I changed the consciousness of the world by choosing to be present and just choosing to have the intention to give this away. Like we change the consciousness of the world. So share this with other people. It just, it's so beautiful that she took the time to write this for us. Like it's just like our souls are, are meant to be fed and they're starving. There's so many people. Mother Teresa wrote that, you know, there are, there are, there are very rich people that are starving, you know, they're starving for closeness, for affection, for, for food, for their soul, and they don't even know it. They're in the deepest poverty and they don't even know it, you know, and they're just like, oh, look at those people in poverty, you know. And some of them are aware, you know, and their lives are so empty. They reach the top and their lives are so empty because they don't know that they need to feed their soul. Feed your soul, right? I wish you so much love. I'm, I'm right here still, but I'm like, I'm, I wear this to, and I put it on. It's a long one to drop down from your head into your heart. Okay. So she says, right? Here, the most important work has been done in France, and especially by the Abbe Bremond, B-R-E-M-O-N-D, whose prairie at Poissy, Poissy, P-R-I-E-R-E, -E -E, at P-O-E-S-I-E, Poissy, and I never took French. <laughs> I just, I did yoga in French when I lived in Montreal. So I know la pidoie, la pied gauche, ouvre la porte. <laughs> open your heart, open your chest. And like raise your right foot up to the la cille, to the ceiling. <laughs> right foot, left foot, you know. Un, deux, trois. <laughs> Bonne nuit. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. A bientôt. A bientôt. But I learned with a little Montreal accent. So sorry if you are in France. They're like, oh, <laughs> please speak English. <laughs> I loved it, though. I loved it. Anyway, so, um, and his introduction a la philosophie de la prairie, P-R-I-E-R-E, prairie, prior, maybe that's the word prior, based on a vast acquaintance with mystical literature, mark, I believe, the beginning of a new understanding of the character of contemplation. Oh, I wish I could read that in French. Maybe there's an English translation. You know, I know that Google Translate at one time the other day, a f this is a, oh, maybe two years ago, I was taking PDFs, oh, maybe it's four years ago, and you could throw a whole PDF in it, would translate the whole PDF from French to English or whatever. It's amazing. I don't know if they still let you do that. They probably don't, so you can't get these, but uh, I'll just try to speak good words into you know, are manifesting. <laughs> yes, you can find it. If it did it at one point, you can find it. Anyway, so find those books. Um, someone read those to us in English. I believe the beginning of a new understanding of the character of contemplation. The Thomas philosophy of Maritain, M-A-R-I-T-A-I-N, and the psychological research of the Merchal, M-A-R-E-C-H-A-L, tend to support this developing view of the mystical experience, even in its elementary forms, as an activity of the transcendental self, genuinely supernatural, yet not necessarily involving any abnormal manifestations, and linked by the ascending degrees of prayer with the subject's ordinary religious life. The disentangling of the substance of mysticism from the psycho-psychical, wait, psychophysical accident of trance, ecstasy, vision, and other abnormal phenomena, which often accompany it. 
oh, I just thought of a 13 year old woman, girl that I know listens to my channel. I'm like, if you're watching, hello, I welcome you. This is still, even if, the, any, if lots of this is over your head, you know, this is still so good for you. Um, I don't know what part of that reminded me of her, but, oh, I know because, um, uh, Evelyn Underhill, um, later she, she talks about, even in this first chapter, she talks about people who try to use drugs to enhance their supernatural experience. And, and, um, you know, I've been around people that have done that and I have not done that. And I've had so many mystical experiences. So I don't think that you have to do that at all um, to have mystic experiences at all. Um, in fact, some people come to depend on the substance to bring them into um, a state, a spiritual state when you know, the divine love creates that in you. You know, it's not something to run after because the divine love, God, I don't think at all, means us to be addicted to these things or run after consolations. Um, St. Ignatius of Loyola writes a lot about that if you want to read it in his writings and in, his, in the exercises of St. Ignatius. And there's consolations and desolations and there's a... <coughs> he has a prayer. It's not the sashupe I carry in my purse. I have that. Well, just recently I have. I'll show you that. I'll put it here. So you can take a screenshot. Here. There's a glare, sorry. But it says, um, oh, this is St. Ignatius of Loyola. I forgot he wrote this. Take, Lord, and receive all my liberties, my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. I made an acronym out of that when I was meditating so I would remember. And don't be a mule, huh? like stubborn. M-U-L-E. I give you divine love. I surrender like Mary. Surrender. Surrender. I think my Sir Eckhart talks, talks a lot about how surrender is one of the highest spiritual states, surrendering everything to divine love. My memories, here's the mule, my memories, my understanding, my liberties, my entire will, all has been given to me. I give you all. I only want your love and your grace. That's all I need. That's all we need, you know. I heard about a man who did this in my C.S. Lewis class, actually. He taught us about a man who did this um, speech at a graduation, and he said, you don't need air you don't need water you don't need food all you need is the greatest theological truth i think he said is like jesus loves me this i know for the bible tells me so it's like i don't know it's like you need your connection to the divine you know because if we have that then the substance of ourselves you know our eternal nature Well, I mean, I have an understanding that continues on, but I won't go into that more. But anyway, I thought of the, the girl because uh, um, I was thinking how she'll talk about substances, but she'll talk about how you don't need them. But anyway, because um, I'm really cautious about, you know, I about what I say on my channel and where I'm speaking. But anyway, okay, so let's go back to this. Um, trance and ecstasy, vision and other abnormal phenomena which often accompany it. And its vindication as something which gives the self a genuine knowledge of transcendental reality. With its accompaniment, demonstration of the soberness and sanity of the greatest contemplative saints. Just a skateboard. Yeah. <laughs> I roller skate all the time. I love it. It just gets you into this flow. I get into a mystic state sort of a lot of the time skating because I'm in a state of prayer, you know, a lot of the time because you have to be really present so that you can keep your balance so you don't fall. And so it keeps you really present and deep in your body. It's just a thing that does that. You know, people can make fun of skating, but, you know, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing like the flow, like when you're skiing or when you're surfing right there in the ocean, or um, 
even swinging or riding a bike, you know, or walking even, you can get in the rhythm, anything you do with physicality. Anyway, um, which gives the self a genuine knowledge of transcendental reality with its accompanying demonstration of the soberness and sanity of the greatest contemplative saints is the last of the beneficent changes which have transformed our study of the mystics. In this country, it is in, in England, you know, it is identified with the work of the Benedict, two Benedictine scholars, Abbot, which means father, you know, I think, Chapman of Downside and Dom Cuthbert Butler, whose quote, Western mysticism is a masterly exhibition of the religious and psychological normality of the Christian contemplative life as developed by its noblest representatives. So there are noble representatives. All these mystics aren't crazy, you know. People can just write them off because they're in their ego mind and they don't understand what the mystics are experiencing. I'm like, yes, I got a kindred sister here, you know. I love it. I'm like, yes, I'm not alone. Like Elliot and I felt like that with each other. My friend Elliot Smith, it's just like we just wanted to be around each other because it was so refreshing to meet another deep, deeply conscious person on this earth. And I know that some of the people that follow me on my channel and on my Instagram and stuff like that, social media, you know, we found each other because we have this deep connection. And like I knew him in life and as a musician, but I, I totally respect people who found him as a musician because he just, he's like a, a speaker for the mystic, for the underdog, for those chasing for these deep experiences of consciousness in, in, you know, he, um, would talk about it in substances, but, uh, just as a medium, you know, uh, he, I never saw him using in front of me, but he would drink a lot, you know, but he was always more sober and more conscious than anybody else in the room. Um, but I'm not, I'm not recommending that life. And I think if he came back here, you know, and he could speak right now, he would say he was, he had been getting sober for the last year of his life and he would not recommend that path you know because it's a kind of surrender but it's a surrender that you become enslaved to anyway um it's like a deception of a surrender but anyway since this book was written our knowledge of the mystics has been much extended by the appearance of critical texts of many writings which had only been known to us in garbled versions or in translations made with an eye to edification rather than accuracy. Ugh, some people just translate, you know, like, I, I'm going to translate this really plain in an ego way instead of accuracy of what this person was conveying they saw in their mystic experience. You have to have the raw data of what they experienced. Um, and she she translates a book by Mathilde de Madberg. Madberg? It's just amazing. But um, she says, read this nine times. I think Mathilde said that <gasps> in order to understand it. I've read it twice, I think. Maybe once and partly twice. I wrote it in the back how many times I've written it. I'm like, okay, we'll see how many when I read that nine times. But Evelyn Underhill translated it, I think. Yeah. Okay, it's accuracy. Thus the publication of authentic revelations of Angela, Angela of Fal Faligno, F-O-L-I-G-N-O, one of the most interesting discoveries of recent years has disclosed the unsuspected splendor of her mystical experience. The critical texts of St. Teresa, St. Teresa of Avila, I love her, and St. John of the Cross, um, which I recommended his book, The Ascent to Mount Carmel. Um, and someone's already read that online. I didn't find this book on YouTube, so um, just a portion of it someone read, but St. John of the Cross, which are now available, amend previous versions in many important respects. We have reliable editions of Taller, T-A-U-L-E-R, and Ruizbrook, R-U-Y-S-B-R-O-E-C-K, of The Cloud of Unknowing, and of Walter Hilton's works. The renewed interest in 17th century mysticism due in part to the Abbe Bramon's great work has resulted in the publication of many of its documents. So too the literary, social, and historical links between the mystics, the influence of environment, the great part played by forgotten spiritual movements, and inarticulate saints. 
are beginning to be better understood. Advantage has been taken of these facts in preparing the present edition. All quotations from the mystics have been revised by comparison with the best available text, yes, and increased size of historical appendix and bibliography is some indication of the mass of fresh material which is now at the disposal of students, material which must be examined with truth-loving patience, with sympathy, and above all with humility by those who desire to make valid additions to our knowledge of the conditions under which the human spirit has communion with God. Oh yes, that just ended in, and it's one hour. And so this is Easter 1930, she wrote that. It says EU for Evelyn Underhill. Oh, she died 17 years after this. Okay, and so the next time I will start with the preface to the first edition that was written in 1910. That's only two pages. And then we begin part one, the mystic fact. Mysticism, chapter one, the point of departure. This is just so amazing. Like, I can't wait till we get into the book. Um, oh, it's so amazing, so amazing. All right, thank you for being here. Come back for the next parts. Share this with any like-minded people. And I love you so much. I mean that, I just give you my love. Um, you are worth so much more than any date that I could ever go on. <laughs> ever, ever. I don't mind being single the rest of my life if it means I get to serve this to people i'm like god you heard that so like i'd like to but um have be in a relationship but anyway i won't get all personal <laughs> that's just me being hungry and tired i wish you so much love Mwah. all right